Thank you, Rob, wherever you are. <laughs> Good morning. Whether here in person or out there on your computer, welcome to worship at North Springfield Church on this third Sunday after Pentecost. If you're here in the sanctuary, please be sure your cell phone is turned off. Thank you. Rob is away on vacation, but with us in spirit. He and Gary pre-recorded the music for this morning's service. Hmm, cool. Rob will be here on June 23rd for our potluck lunch to celebrate his 35 years at North Springfield. Make your plans to be here for that. The monthly community carryout returns again this Wednesday. Please let Jan know if you can help cook on Tuesday or carry out Wednesday at 5. Uh, liturgists are needed for the rest of the summer. The sign-up lists for liturgists and flower donations are in the narthex. Are there any other announcements? It's Jan. Come on up. Uh, just two things for the um, dinner or for the celebration for Rob Phillips we will pr be providing ham. And so bring anything else you want. So bring your favorite dish. I don't, doesn't matter, whatever you like. And uh, we'll have beverages as well. Invite your friends, family, anybody that knows Rob. Let's have a nice big crowd. Uh, the other thing is in the Narthex, we still have these forms to fill out for the blessings box. If you did not fill out one, please do so. We want to include everyone in the congregation in this um, mission project in whatever way is, is that you're able to do it. And I'm not going to list all of the things, uh, but again, you can donate, you can help um, build it. If you uh, um, want to just say that you're going to pray for it or something or invite people, please let us know. We want to make sure that everybody um, participates in this. And... If I don't hear from you, you'll be hearing from me. So <laughs> I, I, I'm not asking you to do anything. We just want to know how you can, how you can help. And we want everyone. This is a, this is a whole congregation activity. And it's, a, it's our mission. And we want to take that mission into the community. And we want to partner with the community. We want to involve them as well. So if you pick one of those up, you can put it, um, put it in the, the, well, you probably won't have one for the plate. You can just give it to me afterwards. They're out in the narthex. Or just give me a call and say, you know, what are the ways that, you know, that I can help. Thanks. Anyone else have an announcement? I guess not. Okay. If, if you're able to stand, let's do the call to worship. On this day, we gather with thanksgiving in our hearts. For God's love is ever constant in our lives. 
On this day, we will talk of all that is ours. Grace upon grace has been poured into our lives. On this day, we will speak of what we believe. We will sing God's songs for all that God has done. Our souls wait for you, O God. Our ears are attentive to your word. We hope for a clear understanding of your will for us. Let this time of community draw us together in unity with a sense of direction and purpose for our congregation and for our individual lives. Renew us within so that nothing we face around us can undermine our faith or cause us to despair. Grant us the eyes to see what cannot be seen and to gaze on what is eternal. May we revel in your work and be a visible witness of your invisible, yet present kingdom. Amen. Remember that the font connects our confession of sin with the grace and cleansing of our baptism and with our baptismal call every day to new life in Christ. We know what it is like to be rejected, but we also remember turning our backs on others. We have experienced conflict as well as caused pain to others. Let us confess our foolish lives to the one who seeks to forgive us on this day and on every day. Everybody else does it, O oh God, and we confess that we do it as well. We listen to those whose promises are sold to the high spirits. We idolize the names of people as they were teachers of ethics. We long for that one person who will make everything right, once again, once and for all. Is it any wonder that we are a disappointed people? Forgive us for turning our backs on you, even as you continue to stretch out your arms to us. Forgive us for trusting in those who prove to be false, rather than having faith in your love. Forgive us and fill us with the spirit of faith, which is given to us. for personal reflection and confession.
Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do not lose heart. God seeks to strengthen our souls, filling us with forgiveness, wonder, and joy. In Christ, in Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. As God has forgiven us in Christ, let us forgive one another. The peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Also, Please turn to one another with words and gestures of peace and reconciliation. For those of you at home, the peace of Christ be with you. Gracious and loving God, who in Jesus Christ has called each one of us to recognize that we are all sisters and brothers and members of your family, unite us together as a community of faith, listening to your word and finding in it our greatest hope and greatest joy. May we hear the words of your mouth and give thanks for your steadfast love and faithfulness. Amen. Amen. Uh, the Old Testament reading is a reading from 1 Samuel. Then all the elders of Israel gathered together and came to Samuel at Ramah and said to him, You are old, and your sons do not follow in your ways. Appoint for us then a king to govern, govern us, like other nations. But the thing displeased Samuel when they said, Give us a king to govern us. Samuel prayed to the Lord, and the Lord said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they say to you. For they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me from being king over them, just as they have done to me from the day I brought them out of, up out of Egypt to this day, forsaking me and serving other gods. So also they are doing to you. Now then, listen to their voice only you shall solemnly warn them and show them the ways of the king who shall reign over them. So Samuel reported all the words of the Lord to the people who were asking him for a king. He said, these will be the ways of the king who will reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to their, his chariots and to be his horsemen and to run before his chariots and he will appoint for himself commanders of thousands and commanders of fifties, and some to plow his ground and to reap his harvest and to make his implements of war and the equipment of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers and cooks and bakers. He will take the best of your fields and vineyards and olive orchards and give them to his courtiers. He will take one-tenth of your grain and of your vineyards and give it to his officers and his courtiers. He will take your male and female slaves and the best of your cattle and donkeys and put them to work, his work. He will take one-tenth of your flocks and you shall be his slaves. And in that day you will cry out because of your king whom you have chosen for yourself. But the Lord will not answer you in that day but the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel. They said, no, but we are determined to have a king over us so that we also may be like other nations and that our king may govern us and go out before us and fight our battles. Samuel said to the people, come, let us go to Gagal and there renew the kingship. So all the people went to Gagal and they were made, and there they made Saul king before the Lord in Gagal. There were sacrificed offerings of well-being before the Lord, and there Saul and all the Israelites rejoiced greatly. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
Please join with me in a responsive reading of Psalm 138, which is written in your bulletin. I give you thanks, O Lord, with my whole heart. Before the gods I sing your praise. I bow down toward your holy temple and give thanks to your name for your steadfast love and your faithfulness. For you have exalted your name and your word above our enemies. On the day I called, you answered me. You increased my strength of soul. All the kings of the earth shall praise you, O Lord, for they have heard the words of your mouth. They shall sing of the ways of the Lord, for great is the glory of the Lord. For though the Lord was high, he regards the lowly, but the high he perceives from far away. Though I walk in the midst of trouble, you preserve me against the wrath of my enemies. You stretch out your hand, and your right hand delivers me. The Lord will fulfill his purpose for me. Your steadfast love to the Lord endures forever. Do not forsake the work of your hands. The epistle reading is a reading from 2 Corinthians. But just as we have the same spirit of faith that is in accordance with Scripture, I believed and so I spoke, we also believe and so we speak, because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and will bring us with you into his presence. Yes, everything is for your sake, so that grace, as it, as it extends to more and more people, may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure because we look not at what can be seen, but at what cannot be seen. For what can be seen is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Thanks. A reading from the Gospel according to Mark, the third chapter. Let us listen for what the Holy Spirit is saying to the church. And the crowd came together again so that they could not even eat. When Jesus' family heard it, they went out to restrain him, for people were saying, He has gone out of his mind. And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebul. And by the ruler of the demons, he cast out demons. And he called them to him, and he spoke to them in parables. How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house will not be able to stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand, but his end has come. But no one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his property without first tying up the strong man. Then indeed the house can be plundered. Truly I tell you, people will be forgiven for their sins and whatever blasphemies they utter. But whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit can never have forgiveness, but is guilty of an eternal sin. For they had said, he has an unclean spirit. Then his mother and his brothers came, and standing outside, they sent to him and called him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they said to him, Your mother and your brothers and sisters are outside asking for you. And he replied, Who are my mother and my brothers? And looking at those who sat around him, he said, Here are my mother and my brothers. Whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and my mother. This is the gospel of our Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. Let us pray. Holy God, let your spirit move in us today to turn us away from the temporary 
and to your eternal love made visible in Jesus Christ. Amen. An old Yiddish folk tale I read goes like this. A man goes to his wise and revered rabbi for advice. He complains. Oh, rabbi, my house is too small for my wife and my children and myself. We get on each other's nerves and drive each other crazy. What should I do? The rabbi sits thoughtfully for some time, and then he asks the man, do you have a dog? Puzzled, the man replies, yes. The rabbi continues, do you keep your dog inside or out? Out, the man answers. After another long moment of silent deliberation, the rabbi utters his profound verdict. My advice to you is to, is to go home, bring the dog to live inside the house with you and your family, and come back to me in one week. Though confused, the man goes home and does as the wise rabbi had instructed. One week later, the man returns. Oh, wise and venerable rabbi, may I dare say, things are only worse. At great length, the man moans and complains about the state of affairs of his home. The rabbi again spends some time pondering the man's situation in silence. Finally, he speaks. Do you have any sheep? The man frowns and then replies, yes, we have four sheep. Nodding wisely, the rabbi pronounces, my advice is for you to go home and bring the sheep inside to, to live in the house with you and your family and to come back to me in one week. Shaking his head, the man leaves. And so the folk tale goes on and on the same way with chickens and goats and then pig, a pig, a cow, and a horse. And finally, after the man, his wife, and his children have been living with that old McDonald menagerie inside their house week after week, the man returns. Oh, wise and venerable rabbi, I am at my wit's end. We can't live like this any longer. There must be something else we can do. After a thoughtful silence, <laughs> the rabbi says calmly, go home, take all the animals out of the house, and come back to me in one week. One week later, a relieved and radiantly happy man returns. Oh, wise and wonderful rabbi, you are brilliant. We have never been so happy and content in our house. True peace reigns there. You know, sometimes we all complain. In fact, sometimes we all do a lot of complaining. I won't make you raise your hand. When in fact, what we really need is to be reminded, like that man in the story, of just how good we've got it. And that sometimes we rely on ourselves or other people rather than relying on God for our help in time of need. The story of the people of God, the people of Israel, our salvation story, is a story of a people who again and again think, we have the solution to our every problem. Think we have all the answers. Our story is the story of you and me, like the people of Israel and like the man who visits the rabbi, moaning and groaning about the state of our lives. It's a story of human wandering, trying to take a path around rather than looking, rather than looking for answers, and, and looking for answers in all the wrong places, foolishly trying to take things into our own mistake-ridden hands rather than leaving them in the hands of God. So let's take a look at the salvation story of the people of God, the Exodus story. The people of Israel have been living as slaves under the tyrannical and brutal rule of the Egyptian pharaohs and the slave masters, making bricks to build all those pyramids. They cry out to God, and God amazingly and miraculously sets them free through a series of amazing acts of power and miracles on God's part. The ten plagues, the parting of the Red Sea, 
the pillar of cloud by day and the pillar of fire by night. God leads them toward the promised land, the land flowing with milk and honey. Ah, but the way there goes through the wilderness. Now, biblical scholars estimate that it's about a 40-day journey through that wilderness. Just a little over a month. But the people try to take the situation into their own hands. It would have been wiser to trust the one who'd already made a way where there was no way. But they did not. Instead, they come up with their own solution. And their solution is to whine and complain, to bicker and fight. Their solution is to rely on the, their own power and wisdom, or the lack thereof, with the result being that it takes them not 40 days to get to the promised land, but 40 years. In big and small ways, they wandered far away from the path. In big and small ways, they moaned and groaned and whined and complained and tried to come up with their own solutions rather than looking to the one who is the solution. For example, this story shows them complaining about the food in the wilderness. Gee, back in Egypt, we had good meat with onions and spices. Here we just have this tasteless hardtack that's just flour and water. And even that's almost gone. Their solution? We want to go back to Egypt. Now Moses tries to remind them, yes, but you were slaves in Egypt. Remember? Remember the whip, the oppression, the abuse, the killing of all of our baby boys, the slaving away brick after brick, the crying out for God's rescue? Nevertheless, not just a few, but the whole whole congregation complained against Moses and Aaron for leading them into the wilderness. But was it Moses and Aaron who led them there? No. It was God who turned the knot to blood, who turned day to night, who parted the Red Sea, who provided an exodus, who provided them a way out. So Moses goes to God, and I can imagine he complained too. These people you gave me, they're driving me nuts. We're camping, and they want fine dining. You rescued them, and they prefer the misery that they were living in. You got me into this. What do I do now? God's solution. Tell them I've heard they're complaining. I'll send them quails every night and manna every morning. Literally. Food from heaven. But the human memory is pathetically short, and almost immediately they complained again, this time about the food that God showered on them from heaven. This manna, it is so boring, day after day after day, and there's only so much that you can do with it. They also tried to take things into their own hands again. They've been told to take only what they needed for each day. But some tried to hoard it, trying once again to come up with their own solution. Maybe if we saved up a bunch of it, we could do more with it. But the hoarded manna, we know, turned rotten and bug infested. God's a little reminder to us every time we take things into our own hands or come up with our own solution, God creates a situation where we have to come back to God each day for what we need to get through that day. This pattern is in the book of Judges, too. The people turn away from God, try to come up with their own solutions, try to rely on their own power and wisdom, and everything falls apart. They turn back to God, cry for God's help, and God, God gives them a solution. God raises up a leader, a God-appointed judge who leads the people in the way of, of, of God. And things go pretty well for a period of years until that judge dies. And then they turn back to God, and God gives them a solution by raising up another judge. And on and on it goes. And this pattern repeats over and over 
until finally the story comes to a climax in today's reading from First Sam. When the people whine and complain, we're sick of these judges who only rule for a little while. We want to be like everybody else. Why can't we be like our neighboring nations? They have a king. We want a king. The people of God sound like teenagers here, right? Well, he has a tattoo. Why can't I have a tattoo? She's allowed to stay out until midnight. Why can't I stay out until midnight? The people of God, like teens facing peer pressure, cry out, they have a king. Why can't we have a king? We want to be like them. Now, you may wonder, as do I, why does God keep helping them? Doesn't God get sick of that? Well, yeah, probably. <laughs> and I would think that God, you know, sometimes gets angry, too. But the more we enter the story of the people of God from a human perspective, the, m the more we understand the misconception of the wrath of God. The wrath of God, a concept prevalent in the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, has always bothered me. And then when I was doing research for a paper in seminary, I discovered that the wrath of God can actually be better translated into the burning love of God. God was compared to a mother lion who roars with protective burning love when her cubs are threatened or endangered in any way even by their own stupidity or foolishness. God is like those of us who are parents, who burn with angry love when our children hurt each other, when they turn away from us, their mothers and fathers who love them, and foolishly wander down a wrong path, a path we know to be dangerous. In the Hebrew Bible, God's wrath, God's burning love is displayed Whenever God's children hurt each other, fail to treat each other as children of God, turn away from God or turn away from becoming the people God created and desires them to be. Anyway, the solution of the people of God again and again, our solution, is to take things into our own hands, to look for answers in the wrong places, to look for power and wisdom in ourselves or in other flawed human beings. How often have we complained and forgotten that the one who has rescued us in the past and who showed us a way will bring us to a new and promised place if we just trust. I'm reminded of a news story I read about a girl named Megan who a few years back won the Ohio Division III girls high school track title in the 1600 meter with her fastest time ever. And that's quite an accomplishment. But it's what happened in the next race she qualified for, which she did not win, that was certainly her greatest triumph. In that race, well ahead of her, was another runner who was obviously struggling and had fallen twice already in that long event. By the time Megan caught up with her, she'd fallen a third time. Megan stopped when she came up to this athlete from an, another school, and she put the girl's arm around her own neck, and she held her up until together that they reached the finish line. And then she pushed the other girl ahead of her so that she would not finish last. And Megan accepted last place for, her, for herself. Megan said later, in the moment, the only thought I had was that she obviously needs help. I didn't want her to hurt herself. Somebody falls, pick them up. So it is with the people of God, the community of faith. Sometimes in this life, you or I try to make it on our own, only to realize that there are some obstacles that we can't overcome unless we do it together. Sometimes in the church we take things into our own hands, come up with our own human solution, and the result can be fighting, divisions, or getting so aggravated with one another that we think of leaving someone behind or just dropping out. 
In either case, the whole mission of God suffers. As Megan so aptly demonstrated, it's together. Holding each other up as we limp along in this broken world that we can best cross the finish line. It's together. Praying and trusting in God's solutions that we can best let the way of God reign. Every Sunday, we're given a power, powerful reminder of the way we try to solve solutions on our own. We begin our worship confessing our foolish and failing solutions. Then when we admit our need for God, we're reminded of and we are granted God's solutions should we decide to live them. Forgiveness, freedom, reconciliation and love, unity. And every Sunday, we're reminded as well of something the Alcoholics Anonymous 12-step program so wonderfully points out for us. There is a God, and we are not it. Let us pray. Lord, you invite us to be part of your beloved community. Help us to remember that we belong to you and through the power of the Holy Spirit to listen to your voice as you lead and guide us into your will. Help us to remember that we belong to one another as well, united as brothers and sisters in Christ. Amen. together in our affirmation of faith, which is the Apostles' Creed, and it is written in your bulletin. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived of the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into the dead. On the third day he rose again, he ascended into heaven, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Shall we be seated for prayer? With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need and all of God's creation. Gracious and loving God, 
We, prof we pray for the universal church and its unity as the body of Christ in the world. Still its storms, calm its fears, and make it a unified evangelizing witness to your power and justice. Lord, in your mercy, we, are. we pray for this congregation, our presence in our community, and our connection to the world. Bless our outreach and ministries. Transform us all into your mission co-workers, your hands and feet and heart in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for the blessings of your creation. Help us to find ways to reverse the damage that we have done through carelessness and inattentiveness, working individually as a nation and collectively with other nations to be better informed and more responsible stewards of your amazing creation. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all who desire peace but experience conflict, and for those who hope for faith in the middle of the whirlwind. We pray for those in need of shelter or food, the oppressed, and those in the midst of violence or war. We pray for the leaders of all nations that you would give them empathy and wisdom that they need in order to govern with justice and grace and mercy. And we pray for the people of all nations, especially we pray for the people of Ukraine, Israel, and Palestine. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for all those in need, the abused, the addicted, the brokenhearted, the depressed, the grieving, and all those who are ill in mind, body, or spirit. Especially we pray for those in the prayer list of North Springfield Church, for Terry and Lori, for Marge and Gary and Kim, for Paul and Becky, and for all those that we now name in our hearts, either silently or aloud. Lorna, Rick, Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We give you thanks for all the saints of the church who have shared the gospel, strengthened by their witness. Help us to share your saving story. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Loving God, you are near to us when we cry out to you. Into your embrace, we commend ourselves and all for whom we pray, trusting in your abundant mercy through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now with the confidence of the children of God, let us pray the prayer that Jesus has taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is now. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debts. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thy is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Who are Christ's brothers and sisters? Those who do the will of God, loving God, loving neighbor. We share what we have as members of the household of Christ. In an attitude of love, then, let us receive our tithes and offering.
Thank you, God, for your faithfulness. We bring ourselves and some of what we have accumulated to praise you and to the work you call us to do. Fulfill your purpose for this congregation as you enlist our offerings and our lives. Help us to do your will. In Jesus' name. does the will of God is his family. Go now as sisters and brothers in Christ and through the power of the Holy Spirit serve others as Jesus did. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the unity of the Holy Spirit be with you this day and every day, your whole life long. And the people of God say, Amen.